London is not just some city. Its spirit stands outside of time. Certain places have influenced its citizens. It is not only a setting, but a presence, a character in various films, novels and poems. My name is Philip Röttgers and I search for London's spirit. I think there are two particular ways to explore the powerful and mysterious place that is London, through literature and through walking. Follow me into a secret world. Follow me to London beyond time and place. In this series I will explore its spirit by walking the city and talking to London enthusiasts. I invite you to join me. Together we will discover London beyond time and place. This is Talks Beyond Time and Place. Hello everybody to Talks Beyond Time and Place. Before you can watch or listen to the next episode, I want to apologize for some technical problems with my microphone. Uh, it's a bit bad in the beginning, but it's getting better throughout the talk. So sorry for that, but uh, my guest's microphone works perfectly fine. All in all, you should still be able to enjoy the talk. So thank you very much and uh, have fun with the next episode of Talks Beyond Time and Place. Thank you. So, hello everybody to today's episode of Talks Beyond Time and Place. Um, my name is Philip Rutgast and my guest today is Robert Kingham. Hello, Robert. Hello. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good to have you here. Um, I'm going to introduce you a little bit. Uh, Robert is part of Minimum Labyrinth and uh, Minimum Labyrinth is the creative partnership of Robert and uh, Rich Cochrane. And uh, they have collaborated on many creative projects uh, since meeting at Cardiff University in the early 1990s. And as Minimum Labyrinth, they offer guided tours, audio books, and much more London related content. Uh, Robert was born in London and uh, lives in South London nowadays, I think. And uh, he's interested in the interaction between people and cities. And when he's not writing or making movies or leading historical walks or doing any kind of creative stuff. Uh, he works as Chartered Management Consultancy Surveyor. And uh, yes, welcome Robert, very good to have you here. Welcome. Thank you once again. And uh, maybe we can start uh, this talk by you telling us a bit about Minimum Labyrinth. Sure. Well, as you say, it's 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 me and uh, Rich Cochrane. Um, Rich Cochrane is a what a character who uh, I met at university, Cardiff University, uh, many 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 years ago. Uh, he's and uh, he's a bit of a polymath, so I've I've sort of collaborated him. Um, like yourself, he's sort of both a sort of musician and a sort of uh, expresses himself in all sorts of creative ways. So. Um, it started off with walks, but but we sort of we've, we've tried to sort of explore other media, and particularly it was actually before the COVID that we started getting interested in audio works and um, audio books and and uh, and things like that. So we've been doing more and more of that, um, but we're always kind of looking for the next media to do things in. We we, we get a bit bored doing the same old thing and try and sort of get outside of our comfort zone. I think that's good. It's a good yes, thing to do. Definitely. Definitely a good thing to do. Where did the name come from? Minimum Labyrinth? Uh, well, Minimum Labyrinth is, of course, from uh, Borges, um, from the the book uh, he wrote, the wonderful story, the Ga the Garden of Forking Paths, which I won't read all of it, but uh -huh. um, if you if you if you know it, there are sort of two characters um, discussing the works of of one of their one of their ancestors, and um, there's a debate over whether this ancestor was um, creating a labyrinth uh, or writing a book, or whether as the book suggests, actually the book and the labyrinth are one and the same. And the other character um, reveals that actually it is it is one and the same. This is one thing. And um, and 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 he says, an ivory labyrinth, I exclaimed, a minimum labyrinth. Oh. A labyrinth of symbols, he corrected me. An invisible labyrinth of time. I, 
an English barbarian have somehow been chosen to unveil the diaphanous mystery. Now, in this translation, which is brilliant, um, yes. he actually says a, he actually says a very small sort of labyrinth, not not minimum. But usually, the old translations are minimum labyrinth, which is a sort of not a brilliant translation. It's a little bit odd, which is what I loved about it. So uh, we uh, we we adopted it and stole it as ours. It's a great, it's a great idea, great, and I see what you're getting at with the, <laughs> it's, it's odd, but it, it fits somehow to, to what you do. So, uh, yeah, great. No, no, I, I always wondered where the title came from. I mean, I could have asked you, but sometimes in between you think, where does this title come from? Now I know, now I know, and, and everybody who's watching also knows it. Um, so, as Minimum Labyrinth, I already said that, and you already explained it a bit, you, you offer a variety of London-related content and, and things, and um, you also offer uh, tours, like day trips to, to Rendlesham Forest. Is it called Rendlesham? Is it, it is right? indeed. Absolutely, yes. And, and you also offer tours like the, the Drury Lane Walk and... Uh, you don't own, you not only offer tours but you turn them into events you also offer pub crawls so how exactly do you develop your tours or your events oh they're all a little bit different um they sometimes come from a particular philosophy so we, we've done two walks um or oh, they're getting on 10 years old now all around the works of arthur macken uh, the Welsh author, um, who wrote some incredibly sort of um, mysterious and horror-laden uh, works, um, and they were really around trying to trying to sort of um, experience London through his eyes. So we were walking around some parts of London that he knew, um, that he was familiar with, and trying to trying to experience it for ourselves, and then try to convey that to a, a group. Yeah, you know, what the what the kind of London was that he saw. That that's for that. But other ones we've done, particularly Pantheon of Pancras and and Drury Lane, which is hasn't been premiered yet because we it was just about ready to go and then then COVID hit. So it's ready to go as soon as, as soon as we're allowed to and as soon as it's safe. Hopefully this year, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. But um, I remember, fingers. yeah, I remember talking to you about it in the in the cross keys. I think you said Absolutely. that you you what ready to to do it's ready to go ready to go and um so so those really the stories that it, in those walks really come from the streets themselves and i go in with an empty mind and and look at what's happened in these areas of london um and what stories they seem to tell so um the pantheon of pancras um was very much around turned into a sort of feminist history because you've got sort of these these the fantastically strong characters, not least um, Mary Wollstonecraft, Mary Shelley, who are sort of living in this area, and it turned into the, all these sort of strong mm. women came out the, the the narrative. So that that became the sort of the the guiding principle, and Drury Lane just is full of drugs and pornography and and drink and violence, and it's just this seething. You love it. I can't, you love it when you when when you're allowed to come over. You love it. Um, oh, yes. And it, it reminds me a bit of uh, Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin in his sort of the very last years uh, when he was sort of semi-retired. He he used to um, he, he got interested in earthworms, and he got very interested in earthworms. And he he used to sort of put a a sort of white square, like a a, a yard or a sort of metre type square on his mm. garden and he just used to study what was going on in there and count the earthworms and it's a great way to retire i think and i'll do that when i'm a bit older but it's <laughs> like that. it's just like that with london you can you can sort of put a square around any part of london and the stories that come out of it infinite you know they they, they, they don't end and it's it's a job to try and pack yes. that into sort of one story yeah but that's a good that's a good um metaphor the the earth warm, worms and the the square that's that's yeah that I, I like this i like this picture i like this image uh you also do or you offer two peter Aykroyd pop crawls uh ah. unfortunately i was never able to participate in one but i will <laughs> as soon as you if, if you ever do them again but uh, yeah. how, how exactly did you come up with these and, and the rules well, yeah well they were the first ones we did and i um 
I'd read, I mean, the first time I got into London history, I've got it here. The first thing I got into London history was was um, Roy Porter. Mm -hmm. Roy Porter's wonderful book, London, A Social History. And this, this predated um, Ackroyd, but then I read Ackroyd some years later and was just you know fell in love with this this lyrical book and thought yes. reading it uh, it it you know my book as they do it starts to fill with post-it notes yeah. and i started looking at reading all these wonderful stories and thinking i really, really want to go there and sort of you know experience these stories then i thought let's go there with some good friends like-minded friends and read the stories there and then i thought we're going to be thirsty once we've done that. So we need yes. to sort of work out whether well, there, there would need to be some pubs on the way. So we, we sort of crafted this this walk through London with sort of various pub stops and these these stories. And it was so much fun that we did it again and again. And we did it for friends of friends and then for friends of friends of friends and then eventually the general public. And before I know it, we're, we're doing this stuff um, for sort of tourists and random people, uh, which is wonderful, absolutely yes. wonderful. Yes, this is, yeah. Uh, this is re really wonderful. So, was uh, was Ackroyd one of the reasons why you you became interested in in London and in London history, or have you always been a London historian in a way? No, I definitely haven't always been a London historian. I'm. Um, it was it was definitely Ackroyd that sort of got got me interested in that. Um, no, well, I, I mean, I wasn't really. Uh, sort of taken by history at school. Well, I sort of mm -hmm. rather put off it, in fact, because I, I, I had a sort of series of um, teachers who were rather bitter that they were sort of secondary school teachers and not university professors, and they kind of took it out on us a bit. Um, so I didn't really enjoy history that much. But now, of course, I just it, it's it's essential. It's fascinating. It's absolutely critical um, to understand history, and you can you know the, the events of the last five years in sort of populism, both in the UK, the United States, elsewhere, show you that it's convenient to forget history and to ignore it. And it's 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 not only fascinating, it's, you know, I think it's one of the most important subjects you can possibly um, put your efforts into. Yes, yes, definitely. I, I agree with that. That's true. So, um, when did you start with Minimum Labyrinth? Ten, ten years ago? Or? Oh, um, yeah, the first, the first, when well, the, the Peter Ackroyd tours weren't really sort of um, billed as that. But then we started to sort of work out, well, this is obviously popular. People love doing this. We love doing it. Let's, let's, let's sort of work out what else we could do. So the first sort of thing that was, we, we called ourselves that was um, something called a line, which was a, a two man, me and Rich, mm -hmm. um, stage show that we did um, a, a few places, including above a pub, the wonderful George pub in um, Southwark. Yes. And and we we did a room above there, which was lovely. Um, then we did it at the um, Museum of London and their sort of theatre. We also, we did it at the, um, uh, the theatre in uh, Blackfriars, whose name I've totally forgotten. Oh, we'll get letters anyway we did it there and it was um <laughs> it was great and it's it's a story, it's a story about um ley lines ley lines yeah. um the, the theory of ley lines as as espoused by alfred watkins um this englishman who wrote about them it's coming up from sort of 100th anniversary of when he first wrote about these ideas of of ley lines crisscrossing the landscape and being these sort of um natural um not natural no sorry not natural the, these man created um routes stretching yeah. across the countryside linking linking ancient monuments and and pro creating this sort of neolithic landscape some of which are in london he wrote about and there are in fact you know some some things that connect there and later of, I mean, it's a very simple theory but then later of course it was hijacked in the 60s by um the hippies in the new ages who sort of yes. started talking about energies and, and and all kinds of other sort of theories and and um nazca lines and ufos that were tracking these ley lines it got a bit out of hand and then of course you know as you'll be familiar the, the likes of alan moore and, and co started sort of looking at them as sort of mystical right. um yeah. invisible lines of influence and confluence uh, between sort of things that have happened in in london and, and elsewhere so that's where we started and that's you know that's the first sort of minimum minimum labyrinth um thing yes yes uh yeah uh, we'll, we'll have to find out what the name of the theater 
in Blackfriars. What's Bridewell. It's the it's the Bridewell. Apologies, I'm going, Bridewell. Theater. I'm going to edit this part. I'm just going to put the yes. Bridewell into into Bridewell. what you said. Please do. Yes. <laughs> okay. So uh, in in these years and and then when doing these tours, was there something like uh, the the First of all, was there something like the most so the most surprising fact that you've learned about London when when preparing oh. these things, or, or maybe even not when preparing them? But yeah, it, well, the, well, usually the surprising things happen afterwards because it's it's what's a wonderful thing is doing these walks and you know they're between sort of ten and twenty people, mm -hmm. and everyone brings their own story about this area and things you hear things that you haven't heard before the most i mean the, the one thing recently i was quite you know amazed at um on drury lane the walk we come to um just outside uh the um uh, just at the end of aldwich um outside the church you've got um the statue of bomber harris mm -hmm. Now, obviously, when this statue went up, it was controversial, and there were lots of people sort of saying, mm, I don't think this is in good taste, particularly. Mm -hmm. um, I read a bit about this more because it's not something that's obviously it's it's there's a very <sighs> there's a very sort of standard narrative of you know of, of, of the sort of the blitz and the war in, in, mm -hmm. in England. It's 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 very sort of you know faulty towers. So I um but I, I'm a big fan, even bigger than um, Hogger Lewis Borges. I'm a massive fan of, of W.G. Siebald. Okay. And Siebald's um, book on the natural history of destruction is about how the destruction of German cities um, towards the second half of the Second World War was a just on a ph terrifying, phenomenal scale um of something that it, it, it much that much eclipse all of the sort of the blitz and everything that was that was sort of um done to england it was done on a on a on a on a horrific scale but his point is that even though it was such a huge thing and that, that you know hundreds of thousands of lives were lost and cities were raised hamburg um yes. berlin was raised it didn't form part of the german literary consciousness it was just there was silence until say the 60s and even then he said it, it was just still it was taboo it was it was not talked about and it, I, I found that so fascinating because of course in England the blitz is you can't stop bloody hearing about it because it's right. this it's this it's this sort of um national consciousness was forged in it um, and you've got Brexiters sort of trumpeting the Blitz spirit as if it's something that that you know they they experienced it and mm. uh, they obviously didn't. So it's this it's this flag that's that's continually waved and just understanding it from the German perspective and that that that's all sort of boiled down into one statue that that stands outside. Um, old witch so it, it's yeah. quite um that was surprising i thought you, you a vista of history opens up right yeah but i i know exactly what you mean with the uh the, the way in germany we we in germany deal with with this period and and with, with the yes. cities at just this period in general so yeah definitely it's it's completely different and and especially after it happened for for quite some time there was some kind of that's that's just not think about it let's just yeah. not even forget it. It, it let's just not think about it put it somewhere in a, in a box and never open that box again it's well this is it yes yeah well, my 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 because i knew this a little bit from my my wife is german and yes. she was born in bad, bad homburg in, near frankfurt and she of course grew up with uh, you know and her sort of history teaching at school was there was a blank right. space you know yeah. it was just it wasn't it's was only when she came to england in 1978 mm -hmm. and she started to sort of attend secondary school suddenly you know this sort of gap in her sort of historical knowledge was suddenly filled in and of course it's quite a shock quite but, a shock, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah but that's 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 that, you know one one sort of thing that's led me um through seaboard um that i found completely surprising you know completely right. sort of um unre un not unrecorded but 
lesser known. Mm -hmm. Such a big thing could be, that yeah. such a huge thing could be lesser known. Right. Funny thing is, uh, if, if you ask people from my generation or even younger, they, they always complain that, like, oh, we only talk about World War II in, in, in history in school. We, we've had enough, you know, which, of course, it, it has to be, you, you have to know about it and it's important. Yep. And, and But it, you, sometimes we, they were like, uh, not again. You know, it, it's completely changed from not talking about it to... Yeah, to suddenly. Get to it's, know everything it's all you can to, so you yeah. never make these mistakes. Uh, yourself but yeah it's, it's yeah. Uh, interesting how this how this changed yeah um, absolutely you already mentioned uh, that uh, you started with you know doing these these tours with groups of, of people with with friends and then friends of, of them and uh, i wanted to know which uh, or what kind of people attend your tours londoners tourists all kinds of, of people are they are quite a wonderfully eclectic bunch <laughs> so um lots i mean certainly because some of the themes we've done around macken with with attracted sort of lots of macken fans mm. i think there's quite a few fans of london like yourself who are fascinated by the sort of darker yes the more mysterious side of london and that, that's just endlessly fascinating there are a few tourists who've um and that's that's wonderful when we, we've had um people come on tours um and they've been in London literally for a weekend or a week and they've just picked something weird to do and something a little bit different and that's I, I'm so that's so wonderful that those yeah, people have yeah. come all this way and they're experiencing London through you know what I'm saying which is goodness goodness knows what sort of picture they'll have of London but <laughs> um that's 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 absolutely wonderful we get we get lots of um we got quite a few um academics on the walks um i'd love to attract more students actually and we do try and offer student discounts but it's usually their lecturers that turn up rather than them which yeah. is lovely but but uh, no it's it's quite um it's all sorts we we, we try and be i mean, obviously we want to be as inclusive as possible we, we do try and sort of be as um appealing as possible to you know a, 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 as mm. a, a wider group as people as possible Yes, yes, I understand that. Maybe more more students will come after after the pandemic is over and people are allowed to go out in the streets. Nobody will sit at home. They will just do I everything so, they yeah. can. Now. Oh, go yeah. outside, meet people, do do social things and, and things like that. What was the strangest thing that ever happened on a tour? Is there something like? Oh, there's quite a, few, quite, quite a few weird things. Wonderful weird things. I mean, there's there's loads of lovely coincidences so we remember at the end of one of the walks um the thin veil of london and um, we were talking about sort of um macken's uh, writing of the the weird and wonderful and how actually that had been taken up quite a lot in children's literature so you had um, um edith nesbitt and um lewis carroll and all these sort of p people who, who, who had sort of created these other worlds mm. in which only children can step into him. I mean, Narnia is the classic where the, you know, children, only children can sort of go into yeah. this other world, the C.S. Lewis's books. And we're talking about this and saying, you know, perhaps there are some mysteries um, that only, that's my dog, that there are, there are some mysteries that only, only children can understand. And as I was saying these words, um, we were at one end of Great Ormond Street and there's this beautiful, um, Great Ormond Street, the East End, has got this this beautiful row of original sort of 18th century houses. It's this picturesque thing, and it's very atmospheric. And from one of the windows up 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 above, as I was saying this, this sort of very pale, sickly looking sort of Edwardian child just sort of waved to us as if he just managed to get up from his sick bed and take some broth, and he sort of waved at us and then drew the curtains and, it, and everyone said how did you do that how did you <laughs> how, how did you do that and it, they thought i'd set it up to the so there's these lovely coincidences um on rendlesham when we were obviously talk, telling the story of the, the 1980 ufo incident um we we walked to the edge of one field where the landing had been and and at the other side of the field it, it, you could see in the trees it was it was clearly a sort of a jcb um doing logging 
but it was it was dusk so it had all its lights on and it was just these sort of silent moving lights just yeah. through the trees and everyone was sort of turning to me going how did you do that you what <laughs> what are you how are you doing i said no, it's nothing to do with me i said it's it's uh, we're gonna we're gonna try and contact them now <laughs> and um that was good but the weirdest thing answering your question at last the weirdest thing was can you hear me above my dog by the way lovely background that's rita who's mad she's a battersea dog's home um uh, <laughs> rescue dog she's, she's mad um, anyway the weirdest thing i think that where i felt weird um it was one of the peter Ackroyd pub crawls so we've been doing it a few years and i was on my way there um i was feeling you know really you know, ready to go on a pub call really excited really sort of buoyant really ready to tell some stories and really take london by the scruff of the neck yes and i got lost i got lost well, yeah. in london i got lost <laughs> and it was just it was around that there's a sort of maze of streets around st, st. bartholomew's mm. and i sort of took a shortcut and i thought i don't know what i don't know where i am where i how do i get out of and i was sort of five minutes i was wandering around and it was quite creepy because I thought it was as if London was this god right. that was punish punishing me for my hubris and thinking that I was sort of, you know, in control, as if it was saying, no, you you are a, a worm and, right. you know, before London. And, and London is, is this sort of mysterious god and um, you need to learn your lesson. And I, it was generally thinking... I better respect London a little bit more after that and not be quite so cocky. Yes, I completely understand that. And I think you're right. <laughs> I think London said, no, 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 no. Uh, absolutely, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I think if you ask me, but it's it's just, I'm, I'm looking at it from the outside. I think it's it's a goddess. It's not a god. I think it's female. But yes, well, very possibly. Very do possibly. You, do you I have might an have... opinion on that? <laughs> Well, that's a whole theological question, and I, 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 I'd have to gather evidence, and I don't know. It's, it's, of course, Peter Ackroyd points out that um, most rivers are female, but of course you've got old Father Thames. So for right. some reason, and so I always associate London as being male. Um, it, it's, it's, it, it does seem to be male. I think it's sort of um, unreasonable, and. Um, <laughs> irrational and it has all the sort of you know it has a lot of masculine qualities it's violent and it's yeah. um you know it's so i i'm gonna go for it's 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 a man god a boy god i don't know yeah a boy maybe i'm gonna this is interesting because i talked to to some people about it and that uh, different everybody has of course his or her own opinion but uh, right now i have like it's, it's equal between it's a female and then and the male god or female or male city uh which is uh, basically leads to to the topic uh we want to talk about which is one of the reasons why i invited you to talk about uh, pagan london in the documentary you made but first of all i wanted to ask you another thing uh and i wanted to talk with you about the project for n the the proper ah. song and the music video uh to commemorate thomas de quincy's tragic Love with Anne of Oxford Street. Uh, maybe you can tell a bit about the story behind the song and the project. And for those of you who haven't seen it, I'm going to put, of course, the video into uh, the description so you can all see and, and just hear. Excellent. Well, it was obviously I, it was it came from um, me reading um, Thomas De Quincey's Confessions of an Opium Eater, which is quite quite sort of wonderful book, very lyrical. Mm. and an elegant and I, I came to it i came to sort of thomas de quincey like arthur Mackin as being a sort of visionary of london that that that, that peter Ackroyd had written about so i read i read some of his works and I mean, it's a very tragic story um thomas de quincey is not a particularly is not a character you warm to he 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 feels like someone that turns up at your house and doesn't leave <laughs> Um, he's interesting. I mean, he's interesting. The, the writing is effusive and wonderful. Um, so he wrote this, you know, he, he wrote this, 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 um, narrative about his, his drug escapades, um, in London, which are all pretty sort of bleak and tragic. Mm -hmm. and, and particularly this encounter, this very poignant encounter with this young prostitute, um, called Anne. 
and um, I I thought what I'll do is write a prog rock song about it, and I what was else? still not sure. I, what else can you? How else can you respond to something like that? I what else do can the you same do? Thing, yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's it's the only natural response. So I um, wrote this. The only one I've sort of. I, so I sat down. I, it was it was. Um, I tell you how I wrote it. I was I was working at the time in an office on King William Street, mm -hmm. which just leads from Bank to London Bridge. Um, and so at lunch times, I used to go into um, the very wonderful St Mary Walnoth, which is next to my office, um, the Hawksmoor Church. Right. Uh, be, be, and it's a beautiful building. Um, and it had a piano in it, it had a, 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 a rickety old piano. So I used to sort of sit down there and sort of write this song in, at lunch times. Um, <laughs> what a location and then to write this. The, this wonderful, wonderful yes. location. So we, we, we actually premiered it, um, the song, in St Mary Walnoff. We did a sort of lunchtime concert. It was myself and um, the wonderful Nicholas Haidu. Mm -hmm. the musical genius who usually plays keyboard in in the band i've been in uh, but in this case he had his double bass um bertha big bertha <laughs> and um she sounds great uh, especially in the echo residence we also had a wonderful um alto saxophonist uh simon dickens who was playing that so we we, we premiered it in the public place since then we, we recorded the studio with um the the, the members of um uh, well, for many years we haven't we haven't gigged for uh, nine years, but I have also been in a band um, called Hobo Erotica, oh, yeah. um, and Hobo, <laughs> Hobo Erotica are a seven piece uh, were I should say a seven piece comedy comedy funk band, and uh, so we recorded um, Fran, and that was great. Um, but I really wanted to do something more with it, and the drummer, um, who I must introduce you to because you are he is the British version of you. Um, okay. Phil o, Philip O'Donnell, Phil O'Donnell, let's call him Phil. Um, he's a drummer, yeah, yeah. he's also a filmmaker. I, I met him as a filmmaker, so he 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 um he filmed the film, um, and I sort of directed it. And my daughter was in um a great um sort of Saturday morning dance and drama class that she did, so I, I sort of sort of recruited two of the sort of um two of the older uh students in there and said would you up, would you be up for playing a uh, drug adult uh, 18th century writer and a young prostitute and of course they said yes, yes um there's a wonderful contact we had jessica lemp who's a costume designer she helped us get the look right we filmed it it was great and it was such a laugh um and it's yeah i'm happy with the result given the budget was zero Yes. Um, apart from like a few hundred quid for the hiring of the costumes, I, you know, it was great fun, and I'll I'd do it again if anyone yeah. paid me to. But I doubt they will. Maybe we'll we'll see we'll see what happens, <laughs> especially after this talk. But <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, who's out who there? Knows? Yes, who's, someone's out there who wants to do that. Yeah, yeah, but I, I really like it. I, I really like it, and of course, there's the little reference to From Hell in there. Yeah, so on, I'm not yeah, going to spoil anybody because uh, look out for that. Hmm? Yes, but you're saying to the to the audience, look out for that. Right, right. Look Stay out there. for that reference. Right. Extra points. Extra points. Yes. <laughs> okay, let's talk a bit about Pig in London, the in London. documentary, because in 2018, I think it was in 2018. Yes. You you made this documentary called Pig in London, a 12 part documentary film series exploring London's historical myth mythical and contemporary pagan connections. Uh, you did it in collaboration with the award-winning filmmaker Jeremiah Quinn, and it can be viewed on Londonist's YouTube channel, and I think it is a brilliant documentary. Uh, it basically was one of the, I, I knew the document, documentary before I knew you, of course. I, I saw it and I thought, oh, this, this is interesting. And I, uh, I like the, the way the, you, you present and, and narrate it. Uh, because it's a big mixture of kind of calm and informative present presentation and then some some Pythonesque moments where you sometimes would expect Eric Idle to be the presenter. I, I really like yeah, I really I really like the approach to you of, of the I don't burst into song. I don't there are no songs as uh, Right, but yeah. Do you think I should have did I miss a trick? Should I no, have done you, a little no, you use? Uh, yeah. I don't think no. You, you you did you did the prop rock song, so this is 
<laughs> yeah. also... Let's keep that to one side, yeah. Right, yeah. So where did the idea for the documentary come from and how did it develop? Well, it, the inspiration came, let me reach for my book, of course, from the wonderful um, Ronald Hutton, mm -hmm. who has written um, some wonderful books. Um, this one particular, obviously, Pagan Britain, which which is which which covers the whole of Britain, and it's it's what we know about pagan Britain. And what what is surprising is there's a lot we don't know. There's a huge amount we don't know. So he's having to take tiny, tiny bits of archaeological and historical evidence and extrapolate from that. Well, what what can we infer from that? It's it, it, it's just a wonderful job he does. Um, I did meet him once actually, just by oh. chance. Um, on on um, <laughs> it was a few years ago on May Day. And I was following the, the May Day celebrations as they went through Greenwich. So there was lots of Morris dancers and um, a green man and lots of drinking. So I had a, I, a very brief um, drink with Ronald Hutton. He's a lovely, lovely man. And um, I sort of outlined, I, is that, but it was before I'd made it. And I said, look, I love your book. And I was thinking of doing this sort of series. And he, he didn't um, try and dissuade me at that point. So he said, good luck with that. So. I took that yeah. as an omen to, to yes. carry on. Yes, I but it was know. it was it was that, and and then I sort of um, I was talking with Londonists. We've, we've been doing sort of we've been good friends. Minimum, minimum labyrinth and Londonists have been very good friends for for, for time immemorial. Um, and so I had a chat with them and said, look, you know, thinking of doing this thing, you know, would you can I offer it to you? Would you like to um, distribute it and put it up on your website? And it was it was very much their thing. Obviously, they they. They love all things weird and and, and, and Londonist, and they like clicks. They love clicks. Oh, they like clicks as much as they like London. So <laughs> they 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 yeah they went for that. So that's where it came from. Okay, yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you how how this ha happened. If they approached you, or you approached them. But yeah, you you approached them. Yeah. And um, yeah, as I said, you worked with uh, with Jeremiah Quinn. Have you always been interested in, in the topic in, in pagan Britain in, in a way or pagan London, if you like? Well, it's it's pagan always been a yeah. I mean, it's always been it's always been there as a sort of interesting theme in a lot of the things we've been doing. But it's 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 wider than paganism. It's it's anthropology, I think, mm -hmm. and it's trying to understand how how how. I mean, I'm fascinated by how humans make sense of the world and religion is one of those things and, and, and sort of paganism and another. And the other theme is sort of that we keep coming across is, is um, uh, it's a kind of nostalgia for a simpler time. It's, um, yeah. and that, that was what we were exploring in the line. It was, it was looking back to a time when things were simpler. Obviously these golden ages don't exist. They're all constructs right. they're all things that you 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 sort of daydream about to sort of try and make your present life better but paganism is one of those things because i think you know christianity is so sort of been so prevalent that there's been a backlash and certainly since sort of 18th 19th well into the 20th and now 21st centuries there's been this there's been this feeling of oh perhaps there's something different and mm. um Christianity represents the mainstream and therefore I'm going to be I'm going to be a cool hipster and and, and sort of look at what else is there it's a, there's a little bit of that in in um in in what's driving people to seek other things and I'm not sort of deriding modern paganism at all it's, it's just there's there's a feeling of thinking is Christianity all there is is there something older is there something deeper that we can know I think that's what that that's where a lot of the sort of interest in it comes from so that was all in and amongst the things we were looking at and then it was coming to Ronald Hutton's works when I first realized actually a lot of the things I'd taken for granted about um, the way that pagan symbolism had had sort of been co-opted by Christianity actually a lot of that was nonsense and a lot of it was created artificially in the 18th and 19th century so you've got um people add it you know people actively searching and trying to create these links that perhaps aren't there and, and Ron Hutton is very keen to sort of promote the 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 evidence which says mm -hmm. actually there's not a continuity you know you've got things yes you've got 
pagan things happening yes and you've got people in the 19th century dressing up and and, and standing on hills singing which is great right. but it's it's not a continuity it's a recreation it's yeah. it's a new thing and it's in itself it's great and it's you know this it's it's not to say it's wrong or it's sort of um um it's unethical or it's incorrect to do that it's just it's an active creation it's a new thing so right. i was interested in that and that, that sort of put all this all these things i thought i knew in a completely new light so um having read the book i thought well let, why don't we try and tell a bit of that story just with london just and just see what does london tell us if right. we if we look at that right yeah yeah i mean uh, you um in the documentary you you mentioned um the welsh guy morgan morganic I, I forgot his name sorry um who, who made uh, a kind of yes. a, a, uh, who created drew druidry for in the 19th century he made a lot of things up that people then thought was were were i think well they've, they've passed down and, and and people don't look at the origin they're just sort of seeing the what's happened right. since then assume it's 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 all authentic but it's yeah. um you know it's like it's like the, it's like the kilt it's the same sort of thing as the kilt which you know you assume is sort of medieval and um this ancient scottish symbol and you know the tartan is this ancient so the tartan is more accurate than the kilt mm -hmm. i'm talking about the, the, the tartan of the kilt really and it's not it's a it's invention it's a nationalist invention of you know the 18th and 19th centuries and it's not it's not that old yeah but it's it's fascinating to to, to deal with these things and then find it is find it out is absolutely these fascinating. things because yeah then you look a little further than you normally do and then, yeah so it is i, I already said that it is a, a 12 part series and then you cover 12 different locations in and around uh, london connected to to paganism uh, in the documentary so how, how did you choose the the locations how did you say i want 12 locations or did you have to research a lot or was there so much to, to choose from how did you choose the locations for the documentary well as it, as they say in the clickbait the mm -hmm. answer may surprise you um because i could only find 12 locations in london that had genuine links to to, to ancient paganism i mean there are there are many more ancient sites in london but only 12 that had an element of worship or, or an element of mysticism mm -hmm. something that can be linked to some form of paganism that has been seen elsewhere so i i could only find 12 now i'm not a professional archaeologist historian so so doubtless there are a few that i missed but um those are the only ones i could find um if there were more it would have been a 16 part or 20 part series so who knows if if other people can uh, point me in in the direction of my errors then perhaps there's more to explore yeah you can do a second a second uh, documentary a second who knows second yeah and i also thought if you mentioned the the uh, but we can talk about this in a minute the the modern day uh, uh counterculture and 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 music and that this is kind of modern day pa pagan pagan london and that you could do an, a series just about that but that's a, a different topic in a way so yeah, yeah okay so 12 locations but yeah but i i think it's interesting because they're all kind of very special kind of different you also of course mentioned the the area of, of bloomsbury and, and the area of seven dials they were a bit of the the center of spiritual london in a way um because yeah the art of the golden dawn the sweden box society and, and things like that so is there anything especially pagan about these these areas why is this the the area of of uh of spiritual london well that's that's <laughs> to give him credit i mean that that sort of um is peter Ackroyd's comment uh who who sort of says london has always been a place of spiritualism and um <laughs> he talks about these areas and um <laughs> and it's great and and you walk around them and then you can't see them as anything but that you know once once you've read his sort of description of these sort of um the quacks and the um the astrologers and the, um, the, the 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 medicine men and the sort of snake oil salesmen that sort of populated this area you, it's in your head and you walk around now and you, you do see sort of wonderful mystical elements 
and you've got new age shops there and you, you can buy some crystals and you can buy some joysticks and uh, and it's it's as if there's you know there's this there's been this continuity but it's an active it's an active sort of um continuity so once you've read Ackroyd then you're kind of stuck with that idea in your head and it's hard to walk around London without seeing it but if you were to say is it really there does it really exist it's it's hard to say i mean you've, you, you i guess you've, you've it's impossible for me to answer because you've got to you've got to be someone who's never never seen that before and um you know would would you know it, it, would you have the same feeling if you if you had no knowledge of this place i like to think you do because you you do walk around cities you walk around london in particular and you do feel things and you you do without getting too psychogeographic you do have sensations and you do have impressions and sometimes it's hard to put those in 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 in, in words um and sometimes later you read about the history of an area and it sort of it has a certain resonance right yeah that's that's the thing i always i often wonder the same thing because yes yeah, as, as you know i also read Ackroyd and and i, I sometimes i think oh, I, I can you know that there, there is there's something here that i i can feel something at a certain place and then i think is this because i i, I read about the the history of the place is is, it, is this this the reason why i i think i I, I I feel something, or I can perceive something, or, and, and would this be different if I didn't know about the, the history and 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 about this approach to to plays that Ackroyd and, and some of the other writers have? I think this is kind of an. And it would would be interesting to talk with someone who's never been there or who's been there and doesn't know about it. And maybe yeah. they would say, well, that, this, this comes across a lot in your book, of course, because you're um, when you're writing about it, it's clear how much you you yes. you know you absorbed the history and absorbed the folklore and you're sort of looking at it through those eyes and you can't do anything otherwise and you, right. it's lovely the way you describe you you know you're very frank in saying um you know this is this is what i can see and this is what i'm looking at and this is what i'm thinking about because you know i've got all these stories in my head right. and i must look i must look pretty weird to everyone who's watching me sort of look at, and it's <laughs> quite funny the way you've written it it's like you can imagine you sort of Yes. entranced by this sort of jack the ripper location and you know just just full of the sort of the horror of the moment and people <laughs> wandering past you going is that is he all right he looks right he looks he doesn't look very well no yeah yeah but that's <laughs> this is exactly yeah as you say this is how i i'm i perceive these 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 walks now i perceive myself when i thought yeah, yeah. Must, yeah. must think i'm crazy i've mm. walked through through temple bar three times you know to just yeah. to walk through it or something like that and yeah that's, that's strange but then in, in the documentary for example you also talk about the Stanwell curses which today runs through Heathrow Terminal 5 I think yes so uh, uh what, there's there's probably nothing there to to remember as some kind of yeah holy spirit or whatever that there is uh, you probably don't really feel something there so but what what would you say in in general is, is there something like a, a genius lock high to to these places places that you found or is this again it's, it's just probably completely depends on one's own uh, perception of these places probably. i i would like to think there is and i i think there is a genius loco how it exists and whether it's anything more than the collective consciousness that we bring to that place when we visit it because we're humans and we're, we're going to places with stories in our heads um even if it's that i think that's still real that still that still makes it um uh tangible and uh, and real it's it's obviously very subjective though but i, I think places do have a, a genius loci I'm, right. I'm sure they do I, I think so too and i think it's interesting that you what you do in, in the documentary is just you uh, you connect places or, or, or idols to to what happens there nowadays like the the Dagenham idol and the pot factory that produces mo modern day effigies as, as you call them uh so so maybe there's there's a kind of continuity it de depends on how you how you see these things this this is again we we always come back back to to how you see yourself that is yeah. a very subjective, subjective thing well and that all goes back to my sort of um my my feeling that there is we, we love to think of ourselves as modern we love to think of ourselves as the products of the enlightenment of science of rationality and i don't think we are i think yes that's that's quite a, a, a sort of veneer mm -hmm. and there is 
still so much in our psyche that is predisposed towards the irrational towards magic towards religion yeah. um towards all these things that, that that we we haven't got rid of i'm i'm it'll become it'll be no surprise to you um, it'll be no, no surprise to you that one of my favorite books is um jg fraser's the golden bow in which he, he which he talks about this it's got his name on the front oh, let's put it there so so, yeah. so james fraser there he is um it's been pointed out how problematic that this is i mean he was a, a bit of a sort of armchair anthropologist he's processing a lot of anthropology which nowadays you would regard as not very um objective you know there's a lot of colonialism there's a lot of sort of um there's a lot of missionaries um describing the over uh, perhaps exaggerating the the colorful antics of the natives that they wanted to sort of portray as subhuman in order to sort of say well let's um rape the land and take the natural resources and convert them to christianity so there's a lot of that that's sort of packed into it that's that's a, a, that's the material he's dealing with rather than particularly phrase himself so there's a lot wrong with it but but i think his central argument um that there is this sort of seething irrationality um is fascinating because it, it mm. explains so much it explains yeah. why people um vote for donald trump yes. it explains why populism is popular um it explains that there is a visceral response to a lot of things that we would like to think rationally yeah. crazy thing but actually at a sort of at a, at a subliminal level so fraser carl jung and um these people all sort of that, that's where my thinking comes from there is mm -hmm. there's a lot that's under the surface that dictates what we do in ways that we don't even realize right yeah yes i, I agree with that uh, definitely um thank god for, thank god for that sorry <laughs> thank god for that thank yes. god you agree well, yes. so we'd, we'd, we'd have a massive argument there it'd be terrible that, that's right I mean, it that's would be true. a good podcast it'd be a great great video podcast but it, anyway. maybe maybe we can we can find a topic that we can argue about but let's maybe... let's pretend that we disagree <laughs> I, I love donald trump no that's that was too, too, too... i didn't 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 sound convincing no, no just stupid i was um when i watched the documentary i i, I thought as i i said maybe uh, this debate what have the romans ever done to us uh, done for us done to us done for us yes. sorry this came to my mind because i had the feeling that most of the um cults and and religions that they came from from outside of britain that that were you know uh they were important <laughs> by yeah. the romans in a way so did all the london cults and, and religions come from outside or was there something well the faint the the, the famous ones did so the roman ones yes i mean mithras um they're all imported but some of them aren't so the cursus so the, you mentioned the stanwell cursus cursuses only exist in britain and ireland yeah. they're not found on the continent i mean there are obviously contemporaneous um earthworks and monuments but the cursus is these these two long parallel mm -hmm sort of paths in which you nice. you process through the landscape that's that's just britain and ireland so yeah. you can only conjecture why that is it's it's but that seems to be you know sort of yeah. fun coming yeah. from this country it's um yeah probably uh that's the thing so um you you just mentioned the Temple of Myth Mithras and in, in, in the documentary there's also uh, a London stone so I have the feeling that these these sites and these artifacts they're still kind of they're very very popular they're, they're kind of everyday uh, Rome, uh, uh, London of the public image of London and and many rights have found their way into traditions and, and into culture so what would you say how important our pagan beliefs for, for london's history and, and culture oh that's a really good question i i, I don't think it, i i think it's quite marginal actually because i think um it's it's only a very small influence mm -hmm. um but it is an important one and i think it's 
the thing that links them all to other things that sort of you know have shaped London. I think Londoners want to feel connected to London. Yes. Because it is a it's a big place. It's an impersonal place. Um it's often, I mean, I was born in London, but, but most most people who live in London aren't. You know, they, it, it draws people in as, for economic reasons. You, mm. you come to London, you come to London and it's this big impersonal thing and you kind of want to feel connected. And I think history is one way in which you do that, even if it's a sort of rather macabre, mm. strange history. It's still a way of sort of finding resonance. So, so I, think, I think that's what's driving the way people look at, London and the, the fact that Peter Ackroyd in St Clair is you know so popular in terms of dig, digging below the surface because they give you as a reader they give you that instant connection and you, you yes. can sort of see that I mentioned um Roy Porter's I read mm. I read I read Roy Porter's London the social history mm. the first one I read I read it um when I just moved back to London mm -hmm. after after university I was living in a cheese factory in Dalston, um, which is another story. Yes. Um, and I was reading this, and what it was wonderful readers absorbed by it. Um, and towards the end, when it starts sort of coming to 20th century and it starts talking about you know London, it is it an amazing feeling. It was almost like it was a being on a train, um, traveling through unfamiliar places, and then you start to pull in, you, you recognize certain things about the landscape and certainly certain buildings and, and gradually it becomes more and more familiar until you're you're here and you're like wow i've just arrived at you know the same destination yeah. i'm here as well and it's it's this it's, 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 it's uncanny sense of um almost but not quite being able to understand and imagine and uh, and feel london at once as yes. opposed to through the usual ways we yes. experience it which is very small and you know it's it's where you live and where you work and you yeah. commute and socialize and but trying to see the big thing is not yeah. easy I, I i see what you mean i see what you mean definitely yeah and it's also um interesting because i was uh, uh wondering a bit what what um maybe gods and goddesses Londoners worship today if, if there's still some kind of maybe not even consciously but maybe if, if there's some mm. kind of paganism modern day paganism in, in London I don't know people believe in, in money and in, in the belief in the empire something like that there's still some yeah. kind of in, in the tradition of paganism I wondered if, there's, if it's still like that I, I think they do because I think the, the, the bit I get from the thing I take from Fraser, Sir James Fraser, and you can see in so much of modern politics and, and culture, is, is people want a mm. odd figure. They want mm. a sort of leader. They want a warlord. They want a spiritual guru. And they'll look for that figure in anywhere they can find it, in politics, in music, in literature, in, in, in a, anywhere they can sort of idolize somebody again, or something and, and look up to that. <laughs> yeah absolutely and, and, and this is the thing and this is what i like about um um joe biden is he's he's quite boring and no one thinks he's a warlord and he's right. just a sort of competent politician but he's not a tr you know he's not a sort of tribal warlord and yeah. that was the thing that i think people wanted from trump those yes. who yes fell in love with the idea uh, which meant that that was all that mattered. The facts didn't matter. Politics didn't matter. The destruction, you know, the environmental disorder, the racism, that didn't matter. It was here. We've got someone who's a new Apollo and it's going to lead us into the new age. And it was this, this, these deep sort of patterns that, that, mm. that people fell into without, you know, without, without yeah. admitting it, without knowing it. Right. Yeah. Terrifying. It, it really is it really is and it, it's i mean it's not only trump it happens happens everywhere oh, no no it, it's it's close to home here yeah yeah and it's this this is interesting because it kind of is a global movement <laughs> to it to, is to search it is. For, for people of figures like like that um yeah 
So this is interesting. I also wonder, but we, we basically uh, had this a bit already, if dealing with London is, is like, or dealing with London itself is like, like worshipping a god or a, or a goddess also. But uh, maybe Londoners do it unconsciously, <laughs> serving their god by, you know, and in various ways, maybe. I, th I think they do. And, and London fits, it, as we spoke about before, it fits the... Um, description of a god I mean, it's capricious it's you know it's it's impersonal it, it does demand sacrifice right uh, and that's back to sort of de quincey's idea of london being this um labyrinth that is a, a, a london is the minotaur at the middle of this labyrinth devouring virgins uh, you know this is innocent people coming in to seek their fortune and being eaten by yes. it. it's, it's this this very ancient image yeah yeah <laughs> um what what is it like uh, um, um, today? Are there still spiritual societies in in London? Are there still druids? <laughs> there are, yes. And I I mean I didn't touch on that very much because that's it's kind of a separate subject in a way. I mean I wanted to sort of um, very much focus on historical paganism, as in sort of pre ancient uh, and sort of pre Christian um paganism there's a little bit of paganism that runs alongside christianity although not as much as as, as as you might think but modern paganism there's a whole other chapter to be written about that um in terms of you know the modern druid movements mm. freemasonry all, all, all of these things that seek wisdom that seek ancient knowledge and um yeah. that's a um but yes it's 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 very much active someone someone shared on facebook someone shared a video made by two uh latter-day adherents of the um the golden gorn mm -hmm. which was something that arthur macken joined as a sort of offshoot of the um some of the sort of spiritual movements at the end of the 19th century and you know w, the, the, the gold wb yates was involved in this and right. uh, and others and they're still going and yeah. um, um but, but but doing videos now and offering offering discounts on merch <laughs> yeah i i, I stumbled a, a, across a, uh, a, a, part of a playlist on youtube recently about uh, uh order of the golden dawn and, and the modern day how how they what they do today and, and modern day videos of uh, rituals and then people talking about their experiences i found it quite interesting to just uh, I, i'm an observer you know I, i'm not really someone who who would participate into, in, in something like that it's just interesting to observe and and watch these things and oh this is interesting i could watch things like that for hours hours without being part of it it, you know? it is it is fascinating it, it, yeah. and I, I i love it i mean i said well I, I see the value in it and i yeah. see the sort of there's the, the it's not to be derided I mean, I'm, I'm sort of being quite flippant but it's it's um it is that search for stability mm. and knowledge right um i because i think i mean rich is big on this and he's sort of forever sort of finding different ways to sort of explore this um there are two sort of modes of knowledge one is to say it's the scientific method and it's to say actually we're as we go along we're finding out more and more about life the universe and everything and we're, we're progressing in knowledge we're, we're getting mm. cleverer we're discount we're sort of peeling away old prejudices and we're, we're learning that's that's one model but the, the other model is to say we have lost ancient knowledge and we mm. used to be very wise and clever we've forgotten it and what we need to do is is get back to that state of ancient wisdom um and there's a real appeal to that I, it mm. doesn't it doesn't stand up to sort of rational scrutiny but there's a real you know that, that that's sort of somehow very appealing you know the older something is the more um reverent you should be about it and the more um the more truth there must be and i think that's part of what fascinates people about paganism is mm. the idea that this is very old you know this is far earlier than um christianity and, and then therefore for some reason it must be closer to you know god's creation it must be closer to the truth yes. and i think that's that what that's what drives a lot of the fascination with it yes yes that's that's definitely true uh, sometimes i also think maybe with we, uh, what we definitely lost maybe somewhere along the way is, is this is some kind of magic you know this some some kind of we we're, we're, we're very rational we're, we're very in in light and, and this is very good but we, we've lost a bit of the 
mystical <laughs> uh, stuff on on the way. And I think it's sometimes it, it could be a good way of, of seeing things if we, we would include that again or, or let, yeah. We not only see it in a well it's it's way. it's it is a drive and i think that's why i sort of um i don't agree with richard dawkins for example who whose sort of argument seems to be that it's uh, you know religion magic is is um it, it it's unscientific well of course it is that's the point of it mm -hmm. and I, I think it kind of ignores the fact to which that need for magic that need for something that isn't science mm. permeates people's thinking permeates people's lives not to say it's correct not to say that mm. you know it's real or it's or it's correct in the same mm. way that science is real I, I think sort of you know from what i've read dawkins sort of misses the point of that and and, and thinks well it's not provable therefore it's it's it, it, it's not valuable Mm -hmm. but people need meaning in their lives um and they've got to find it somewhere and if they don't find right. it you 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 get all sorts of uh, well you know anything can creep in and you can find that their ideologies arise that are not very pleasant or right. um yeah. conducive to a working society yeah 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 that's the thing i think this is what we can this this, this is what, what it all what it is all about people have to find or want to find meaning in their life and yes some some do it that way some do it another way everybody does it does it on its own so that's probably the the basis one thing i, I also found very interesting i want to to point this out again uh come coming back to the documentary is that uh, water is an element that connects all mm. the sites that you 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 found the 12 sites and then of course as we already had that that in, in london this is the, the the strong brown god the father thames um and then uh, maybe this is um I, I think it's just interesting that water is the 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 thing that connect or the element that connects uh, all these sides and that people somehow again there's we, we always come back to that people maybe without realizing it they still offer things and to the water they're still at the water i, I had this image amount of people throwing things into the into rivers like trolleys or bicycles and sometimes even themselves when they commit suicide it's a kind of sacrifice without even knowing it i think this is interesting because water is in this, this element that yeah it's, it's the most mystical element maybe and this is so i thought it was interesting that water is the thing that connects all these these sides and i think it's a very this is something typical for for britain too it's not something that happened in, in europe a lot but maybe not that much it's more of a, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're, we're getting to things that are above our pay grade, but um, in <laughs> terms of theology, but I, I think yeah, water is, I mean, we're 90% we're made of water. I think I've got that figure yeah. roughly right. Um, it is the stuff of life. You know, we can't, we can't live without it. And, and, and it does attract this and therefore it has this meaning to it that um, is very strong. And, you know, the, the river, the Thames is, is, is just a sort of, um, a wonderful thing and um it does my, my mum is funny she's but whenever i used to sort of go for walks with her and she'd come on some of the pub crawls um she would walk across london bridge and she'd always say aren't we lucky she'd say <laughs> uh, you know people millions of people have to travel all across the world to see this and we live here and uh, you know that I, I absolutely agree it's it yes. uh, well, there are other rivers obviously other rivers are available but um yeah but that's 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 true i mean it's it's every time i, I come to london it's never i never really i'm never really there until i i've, I've seen the thames once i've been to yeah. the thames it's it's sometimes no, this, this is the thing yeah. now i've arrived you know <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know why but there's this this yeah, I understand your mother very much with, with that. It's, it's yeah, exactly absolutely. what I feel too. Yeah, this is yeah, strong brown god, Father Thames. Strong brown god. Right. So um, yeah, I can only uh, uh, recommend everybody of our or to everybody who watches this to to watch the documentary by Minimum Labyrinth yeah. about pagan London. It's very good, and. Uh, 
I always finish the talks with some more general questions. And the first question is, what is your favorite place in London? Or do you have a favorite place in London? Oh, it's really cool. I mean, I've, I've someone, I've, I've I have said before when I've been asked that the river, you know, is my favorite place as we've just been talking about. Um, but since you've put me on the spot, I'm going to say Blackfriars Bridge, mm -hmm. um, which, oh, in a few weeks, I'm looking at the date, in a few weeks' time, 25 years ago, um, was where I um, proposed to my wife. Oh. So um, I'm going to say it's Blackfriars Bridge. Obviously, that has a very great memory to me um uh, i did yes. go to, i went down on one knee on blackfriars bridge um she thought i'd hurt myself and had fallen <laughs> over so but I, I you know nevertheless she said yes and and here we are 25 years later which is wonderful so I, that's, thank you that and that's that's got a real so i have a real love for that bridge of course yeah so um i was just thinking 25 years ago okay yeah yeah that's a it's a great great memory very nice yeah of course then it has to be black Forest bridge and then, then nothing else um are there still places or, or topics that you want to research in, in, in from london about london yes and no i love london and we'll continue to do some walks um and hopefully you know more more once once we're out of lockdown um I'm, I'm thinking of a new one which is uh takes you from limehouse up to hackney along the canal and there's a sort of few stories we'd like to tell about yes um that which are in connection with i'm going to do a plug here um in connection with our book called london baroque um I which is i'm sorry no I well i just it. i just did because i'm yes. brazen brazen shameless uh anyway we're gonna we're gonna try and do a paperback of a version this year because we've, we've we've sold out the halfback um and there's a walk i think we'd like to do starting at limehouse which which is all about london being this place where the the, the the things the goods of the world clustered together and this is all the theme of baroque that the baroque mm -hmm. is all about pulling together everything in the world and encrusting um your knowledge and your experience with 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 everything and that's that's really sort of what runs through baroque mm -hmm. art and music of so we're going to do a new walk there um so there are lots of walks that you know we we want to do we, you know ideally if i was immortal i'd like to sort of cover every single square mile of london and, and, yes. and do it bit methodically perhaps i am immortal i've got no evidence yet i have not perhaps i will do that um <laughs> but there are other themes that we want to sort of develop um that aren't particularly to do with london um so we've in lockdown rich and i have written a um nine part audio drama um called bluebird which we we're hopefully as soon as we're allowed to we're going to start casting and recording this year if if the pandemic permits if um, you need someone which with is, a german accent let me know about you i might do I, there you are some polish there are some polish characters but there's there's okay. no i can write i can write a german character just for you but, you probably um, have enough german connections already so <laughs> I might but, if you need but that's one, that, let me know but that's all about um th that that takes as its starting point um project mk ultra mm -hmm. um which you might be familiar with as the sort of the cia um funded program over many decades to look at very esoteric things like mind control mm -hmm. um and it sort of finds its modern counterpart in things like the nudge unit which is a sort of part of government which is quite benign in its mm -hmm. current form i hope i think which which sort of gets people to do things really without them knowing so there's lots of themes that i see we're, we're exploring at the minute yeah that's interesting london will i think always be one of them but uh, not not exclusively yeah. sorry london uh, maybe he's gonna he or she is gonna punish you again for it i imagine so <laughs> if, if if he or she um, watches your blog I hope, I hope he or she does bro I'll, I'll probably get punished then the next time that i you uh, will you're involved you're involved in this now yes yes so um i also wanted to know this is the one no maybe not the last question but i have one more after that if dealing with london and its history has and its literature has changed your view of the city oh that's really difficult actually um because i don't think it, i'm not sure it has i think it's reinforced it i think you mm. sort of start off 
Well, for me, I'd say you start off with an impression of London, which isn't incorrect, but it's only gradually that you begin to articulate that mm -hmm. and put words to it. But it's still, you know, it's still the sort of same image you have. I mean, I used to go up London with my my mum when I was little, and would you know, I'd be fascinated by it, absolutely, you know, just entranced by it. I don't, yeah. I don't think I had the same. I could express what that was, and it's probably different as I've gotten older. I mean, you know, I've become interested in different things, but um as, as you grow you, you you find ways to express what yeah. you're feeling which is yeah. quite hard to i think yeah that's true okay um my last question is can you name three londoners that would, you would have dinner or a drink with <laughs> <laughs> throughout uh, history you don't have yeah. to you don't. okay i'm gonna no 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 i'm gonna go um it's difficult because a lot of famous londoners and interesting londoners are probably terrible um you know, Maybe. it'd be terrible to sp spend time with. Um, so I'm going to go with, um, uh, in, in historical order, I'm going to go with William Stukeley, mm -hmm. who was just this fascinating character um, from the 18th century, who was interested in all kinds of um, arcane things. Um, he was, you know, one of the first sort of antiquarians who took an interest in Stonehenge. And um, he was um, a a, 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 it was a, a man of the cloth at some point as a Freemason. It, or he, he dipped his intellectual toes in everywhere. I think he'd be fascinating to yeah. sort of talk to. He'd be a sort of he'd be a fascinating dinner guest. Um, then I'm going to go with I'm going to jump right to David Bowie. Oh yeah. Um, because you know what what a what a what a the world has been a, a poorer place <laughs> since since we lost him. And I I just think he's he's so. But he's so down to earth, so I think he'd be just great to hang out and have a drink with and just, as we're yes. doing, have a great chat about all kinds of things. I, um, I think it'd be good. And then the last one, I'm going to go for someone who's still alive, um, which is Simon Shammer, mm -hmm. um, who is a Londoner, even though he's, he's sort of, um, he's been all over the place and lived in America most of the time. He's born in um, Marlebone. And mm. I just, I just, as, as a sort of, uh, me as a wannabe TV historian, he's just he's just a hero, and his delivery, his storytelling, um, his writing is just I, it's just I can't get enough of. So, um, hi Simon, if you're watching this, hope you are. Um, just like get your agent to call me, and um, yeah, please yeah. do. Yeah, great. Okay, I'm going to add them to the list. I'm, I'm going to collect all the names that be that people say to me, and then I'm going to. I'm going to see in the end who got the most got the most votes. I think right now it's Shakespeare, even though he wasn't born in London, but we could say, consider he him a Londoner. Oh, yeah, yeah he, he's honorary London. Yeah. And then I think he's the one that was mentioned by, by most of, of my guests right now. Well, yeah, so I'll add them to the list. Well, thank you very much, Robert. Thank for you. For being my guest today and uh, for talking about pagan London and everything that came with it. It was a very nice conversation. It's been um, an absolute pleasure and it, I look forward to seeing you in person when when we're allowed and we can we can drink beer and right. and uh, wander around London. So do I, so do I. I will put or a link Germany. Oh Germany, maybe yes. Germany, yes. I, I'm, well I, I this is the I in lockdown I was uh, my wife and I Gabby we, we were we were booked to go to Heidelberg. I know um, about in May that. and then and now I can't so I'm sort of missing I'm missing Europe. Um particularly now we're we're officially not part of it. Um and I can't wait to come back. So what what, what do you think? Are we a, a, will we be able to to travel again this year? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, I think any any prediction is likely to be wrong. So right, yeah, let's, yeah. let's let's just hope it's if it's not this year, then next. But it will be when we do. It will be joyous. Oh, we shall yes. we shall we shall cry <laughs> fat salty tears of joy as we right. fall on each other's necks. Yes, it'll be great. Yes. It'll be great. <laughs> yes, I agree with that. So I will put a link to the Minimum Labyrinth website and the Pagan London documentary in the description and. Uh, so that everyone who sees this can can uh, watch it too and, uh, participate in your enjoy in your, in your, yeah enjoy the my strange uh, world yeah. okay. brilliant so, thank you Robert.